This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosts an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. Working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and a very special welcome to Senator Tommy Norman, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Senator first elected 1991, and serving at the will of your constituents every year since then. Well, David, it's nice to be with you. Every now and then, one of my constituents reminds me that that's 21 years too many for some of them, <laughs> so uh, I keep disappointing them by coming back, though. Well, that's that's got to be a minority of your constituents by uh, by far. So we appreciate your being on. Uh, we're having a conversation here right at the end of April. Some of your constituents and some of our viewers will be seeing this as the calendar rolls into the first few days of May. Session ended back on the first Wednesday of April. Uh, as you have had some time to uh, look back at it, we'd be most interested in your uh, perspective on on issues, uh, major ones, and even perhaps some of the ones that that people were not aware of. So, sir, we're just delighted to have you here to to talk about the issues that you think our viewers need to know more about. Well, it's very kind of you, David. It's always nice to take a few minutes to visit with you. Uh, I, I'm not much of an art aficionado, but I, I've learned one one of the loveliest pictures uh, in my world is uh, Richmond in the rearview mirror about the first part of March. <laughs> right. um, that's uh, quite a picturesque uh, view. Um, uh, after you have spent, whether it's 45 days or 60 days uh, in Richmond during the General Assembly, there's a certain amount of exhaustion, uh, but also exhilaration that it's finally over. Uh, I wish more and more of uh, Virginians would come to Richmond during the session, session I think they would really develop a greater appreciation for the commitment that all 140 members of the General Assembly make. Um, you and I were talking just before we came on the air how it's gotten to be much more of a demanding position. Uh, if you want to be engaged, literally the commitment of serving in the General Assembly of Virginia will take every available ounce of energy and, and time uh, that you do have. And I think some of that, David, is, is due to the complexity of, of issues that we're, we're dealing with. Uh, I try to remind uh, groups when I speak before them about what a really special place Virginia is, and, and I think it's a good backdrop for us to talk a little bit of probably about the most contentious but pervasive subject of the 2013 session. Virginia really is an extraordinary place to live, and I don't say that as a native Virginian. Um, I am a native Virginian, but I think anyone that has spent quality time here and calls Virginia home appreciates it. Uh, we have been recognized uh, for many, many years as the best place to do business in America, and that's because of our uh, right to work laws. It's because we have a very good uh, public education system, K through 12. We have probably the finest public higher education system in America. Uh, even some of my uh, fiscally conservative friends 
uh, question it, but uh, we have the 43rd lightest combined tax burden in America. There are only seven states that have less of a combined tax mm -hmm. responsibility than we do. A corporate magazine has said if you're going to relocate your corporate headquarters, come to Virginia. And you know what? Some people did. Uh, Al Trier or Philip Morris left New York City. Northrop Grumman left San Diego. We've got Mead West Wake Vaco here in Richmond. We've got Brinks here in Richmond. We've got Rolls Royce that has come here. Um, so we're doing that. And I mentioned about our public uh, education system, K through 12. Uh, we've been recognized as producing the best qualified and prepared students to enter the workplace or to enter higher education in America. Uh, so we really are doing some extraordinary things in Virginia. But as you know, last year uh, we slipped from being the best place in America to do business to number three. And I think a lot of our visitors and, and viewers are not aware of it. Mm -hmm. And there was only right. one reason, and that was due to our transportation infrastructure. Uh, we were recognized as having the 33rd best transportation infrastructure in America. Now, I've been to a lot of football games, and I know you've probably been to some sporting <laughs> events, but I've never heard the cheerleaders <laughs> of the pep man get out there and scream, we're number 33, we're number 33. Um, and uh, that alone dropped from Virginia from being determined as the best place to do business in Virginia, I mean in America, to third. Uh, and I think it just points out uh, the crisis that we we're dealing with. Uh, we're doing very well in other areas, uh, but so much of our goods and services are moving across our highways. And you may not be aware of this, David. Virginia has the second most uh, lane miles of state maintained highways in America. The second. second. Wow. Um, and we have quite a transportation infrastructure that is the responsibility uh, of the state, but just trying to get that taken care of as a challenge. So uh, some of the other states, maybe the localities are taking care of some of it. Uh, that, that is astounding that we'd be up, up that close to the second, I mean, up to, well, close to the yeah, top. It is. Well, actually, uh, Virginia has two localities where uh, the local government takes care of their roads. Uh, and I believe, I know Henrico is definitely one uh, because there was something in the transportation legislation we passed that dealt with that. But also, uh, I think it is uh, Arlington that maintains their, their own roads. Uh, so that, while it's an anomaly in Virginia, it's not uncommon in other parts of, of the country. Now, before we talk a bit more on transportation, because there, there certainly was success on that and addressing that, that issue, I think most people see it as, as successful. Going back for just a, a moment about the, the time that people spend who are serving in the Senate or in that other chamber. Um, one of the retiring members of the House, Joe Johnson, and some of his closing remarks when we had the privilege of having him on this program, he said, if I could ask, you know, on your exit interview, what would you change? <laughs> and he said, we don't really have as much time as we need and the compensation is not what it needs to be. Uh, I don't know that all of our viewers know that the base salary for senators is only $18,000 a year, and that hopefully figures out to be at least minimum wage for the, for the number of hours that are spent. But So the question I would have, have to you, Senator Norman, can, can you foresee a time that uh, the two chambers would, ag would agree and, and perhaps those set some basis for even a few years out or something to start getting those salaries up because they haven't been addressed even as the, even like transportation wasn't addressed from, since the 1980s. Those, those salaries are, are that old too. Well, first of all, Joe Johnson is one of the true gentlemen that right. I've had the privilege of serving with. Uh, he, in all the years that I've been in Richmond, he has never uttered an unkind word that I've ever had. He always got, went out of his way to shake your hand and ask you if you're having a good day. I agree with, uh, with Delegate Johnson. It's a very sensitive subject, and it's a very sensitive right. subject because I think too many senators and too many members of the House of Delegates 
are preoccupied with their next election. Mm -hmm. And uh, that statement it permeates a lot of issues. But staying on the, the commitment and, and the compensation, um, it doesn't come out to minimum wage. I can tell you I practice law with a major law firm, and so I have to track my time wow. in the General mm -hmm. Assembly. Wow. And I spend almost twice the hours in the General Assembly related business that I do with my law firm. Um, and they're very, I'm very pleased that they're tolerant about it. And, and I don't say that for any sympathy. I just say it as a benchmark. Uh, we do not have enough time to get the work done. Invariably, uh, we are uh, rushing to wrap things up by these deadlines that we've created. And some of them are, are artificial. Uh, now, I do appreciate the axiom that uh, we will f fill any void of time uh, right. with the work that we have, that we'll stretch it out. But it really is ridiculous. Um, we criticize the United States Congress for uh, the congressman not having read the, whatever it is, 2,200 pages of the Affordable Health Care Act. And they say, you know, we'll pass the law, then we'll read it. I guarantee you in the General Assembly of Virginia, there out of 140, there aren't 40, there aren't 20 who read that budget completely before they vote on it. They vote on it as on a leap of faith in what their colleagues are telling them. But it's because it's impossible. That's one of the last pieces of business uh, that we take up. And when that, it's printed uh, and it's put on the senator's desk, and yes, they have briefings, but there are a lot of nuances in those budgets. So. That's one of the things that has really annoyed me is the, the inability to have the time to thoroughly review some complex legislation like the budget and like transportation. On the compensation, um, you don't come to this uh, public service world with the expectation of making money. My concern is that over the 22 years that I've served, I have seen a number of delegates and a number of senators who were committed to public service but were put in a position financially where they just could not continue the public service because of the commitment that was made. And I think the important point of that is it's almost a self-selecting process. It's almost a vetting or screening process before someone makes a conscious decision to run for the House of Delegates or the Senate. They must ask themselves the question, can I afford to do this? Because the time commitment uh, whether you're a doctor, lawyer, an Indian chief, a teacher, whatever your profession is, it is going to take away from it substantially. And I'm a big proponent of increasing the, the compensation. Uh, the problem is that there are those who, oh my gosh, I'm going to be like Congress. I'm going to vote to increase my, my compensation and the voters are going to be angry with me. So I really can't do that. So I think we are probably mired in the tradition of being a part-time citizen legislature where we rush to get things done, which means that everyone is not completely informed and that the compensation, uh, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but literally many of the legislators would make more money passing a hamburger out the window at McDonald's than they do, do here, just to put it in perspective. We'll, we'll transition over to transportation, but I was thinking there's a parallel when, when, when you and your colleagues have talked about the declining value of those dollars from 1986, from the gas tax and what it does. Uh, there's that same kind of declining value of the dollars of the compensation that we, we, the citizens of the Commonwealth, provide to those of you who are willing to serve. So it has really gone, it goes down every year that inflation goes up as you you and your colleagues are well aware, but uh, we'll, we'll not fix that issue today. But transportation did have a, a significant fix to it. And uh, lay out, if you will, for, the, for our viewers, some of your perspective on how, how you see that going forward, how that's going to help, help us in our transportation and, and help us hopefully move back up to number one. Some of the fiscal conservatives across the state, and I don't say that in a critical means at all, just as sort of a general characterization. Some of our fiscal conservatives were very disturbed that we increase taxes in order to pay for transportation. To me, it's, it's fairly fundamental. First of all, we had a deteriorating transportation infrastructure. 
Last week, Northern Virginia was recognized as surpassing LA as the most congested mm. metropolitan area in America. Mm. Yes. Uh, the goods and services that transport, uh, transported across our highways in Virginia are slowing, slowing down. Uh, the tourism down in the, uh, the Virginia Peninsula and Southampton Roads uh, congested on Interstate 64, congested at the uh, Hampton Roads Tunnel, congested at the downtown tunnels in Hampton, I mean, excuse me, in Norfolk and Portsmouth. We had to do something. Nothing had been done since when Jerry Belisles was governor and there are people watching this show who don't even know who Jerry Belisles <laughs> was. Right. He was governor in 1986, yeah. by the way, and probably one of Virginia's finest governors. Um, long overdue. And I have uh, said to a number of groups, it is a absolute folly for somebody to say, and I've heard it from a number of candidates on the stump uh, who are looking to run this coming November, just cut the size of government and take the money you're saving and pay, pay for transportation. That is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. They say, raise the gas tax. Don't do something new, raise the gas tax. We couldn't raise the gas tax enough to fund the transportation needs in, in Virginia. We're at 17 and a half cents and been stuck there for 30 years. And as you were saying, that 17 and a half percent in the 1980s had some buying power. Yes. It doesn't have a lot of buying no. power in, in, uh, in 2013. And we went through a, a whole litany of funding options. And I've said many times uh, since we were out of session the 1st of April to groups that I've spoken to, if you can tell me how to build one foot of highway with no money, I quit, you take my job. I, I don't know how to do it. I'm not that smart. Um, and pretty soon they start to get the picture. Um, so what did we do? We knew that the uh, gas tax was a declining source of revenue uh, with the what they call the cafe standards that are coming out of Washington about the mileage per gallon that you have to get. It's a declining source of revenue. The recession, people are conscious of trying to, to drive less because when I mean, you go in, at gas price of gas is down now, but you go in and fill up 60 bucks worth of gas, somebody who's making minimum wage job at $10 an hour, I don't know if you stop to think about it, that person's got to work six hours to fill up their car or truck. Um, it's a declining source of revenue. So we, uh, those of us who were involved in it, and, and I was on the conference committee of that, we started looking at sources of revenue that were growing. And the sales tax is the one source of reoccurring revenue that is growing. It fluctuates with the price of goods and services. And so it is a sustainable, identifiable source uh, of revenue. And, and that's why we went to it. And there were some very positive things. We picked up the sales tax. It eliminated the discussion even that His Excellency the Governor was advocating about tolling the interstate highways. It avoided that tolling, which was mm -hmm. I didn't think was a good business proposition anyway. But that's how we got to the sales tax. And then we appreciated also that Hampton Roads in Northern Virginia have the most critical transportation uh, challenges with Central Virginia, Richmond not too far behind, but Richmond's done some self-help with the, their own toll roads. Uh, so we knew that the folks in Southwest Virginia were not terribly interested in funding the demands in Hampton Roads in, in Northern Virginia. So that's why we came up with the regional packages. In the regional packages, every dollar that's raised in Hampton Roads under the regional package, every dollar raised in Northern Virginia under the regional package, will stay in those localities. It will not be sent to Richmond. And that money must be used for new construction. It can't be used for maintenance. It cannot be borrowed. Uh, local governments cannot shift and shaft the money some way. Uh, so we decided that we would do a statewide plan because we are a commonwealth mm -hmm. and that we would Im uh, impose an additional taxing responsibility on the citizens of the most congested areas of Virginia who will be using those roads. Was it perfect? No. I, I said, you know, one of my dermatologist friends called me and said that transportation bill needs a dermabrasion. Well, <laughs> well that, that may be the case, but 
sometimes, just sometimes, when you're in public service, you've got to do what is right. You've got to stand up and be a statesman, and you don't make excuses for what you have done. And this was one of those critical times. We could not continue to kick, kick that can down the road because transportation is not like public education or public safety. If you put a billion dollars in K through 12 in Virginia, we would see a result within a year. If we put a billion dollars into public safety with our, our local uh, police or sheriffs or state police, you'd see a result. It takes years to see the results of transportation. You have to do environmental impact statements. You have to acquire right-of-ways. You have to lease contracts. Um, it's just an awful lot. So, so I say, you know, I don't like paying taxes any more than you do, but I like less watching Virginia deteriorate and continue to slide as being one of the, if not the best state in America. And so I, I don't make any excuses or amends for what we did. It, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't the simplest thing, but simple doesn't work in government sometimes. Right. Uh, so I, I'm very proud of what we did, and it will. It will change the transportation infrastructure of Virginia for the balance of your life and my mm -hmm. life. It, it, is, it is a major, major historical advancement, uh, maybe the most uh, historical and significant piece of legislation to the citizens of Virginia, even those who don't like it that I've seen in my 22 years. You know, thanks for that, that excellent explanation. And so will it be a couple of years or three or four before we will really be able to start seeing some of the impact? Because I think our viewers should understand that the money is not there just like that. Yeah. It, it has to be collected. So what, what is the expectation? That's a really good, good point, David. Um, obviously, with the cost of transportation, uh, projects, we're going to have to accumulate the money and, and bank it. Just to give you some mm -hmm. idea, down in my area, uh, in Hampton Roads, one of the top projects is a third crossing between Hampton and South Hampton Roads to Norfolk and Virginia Beach. The last uh, quoted figure I recall on that was in excess of $5 billion for that one project. Uh, to run a third lane from 295 on on 64, where you have the cutoff from 295 and going just down a little past Williamsburg, just adding a third lane, whether it's on the shoulder in the median, three billion dollars. Three billion. And I will say the rule of thumb that those of us who are involved with money use is we think a one to ten ratio. So if we go borrow the three billion dollars to add a third lane on Interstate 64 between roughly Williamsburg and 295 up there uh, in Henrico. We figure a one to ten ratio if we're going to finance it for 20 or 30 years. That's 300 million dollars mm -hmm. every year mm -hmm. just for the debt service on that one project. Uh, so the costs are, are enormous. Uh, so we've got to accumulate that money uh, so that we have the ability to go to the market, uh, borrow it, uh, and do the bonded in, in indebtedness. Um, but we can start seeing some, some progress. Uh, every uh, transportation planning organization, what we call TPOs, uh, they have their priorities. They know what the priorities are. Uh, down in Hampton Roads, the number one priority are, is the third lane on I-64. Um, Northern Virginia has its priorities. They work with, uh, with VDOT. They have six-year plans. They have public hearings. So we know the projects we want to do is just a question of funding it. Well, it's, it's, uh, it, it is outstanding, I think, what, what, what was accomplished in the, in the short session, too, that you got that, got that done. Uh, we're about out of time. But before we lose that last minute, minute and a half, is there another issue uh, that wasn't so outstanding and it's so major that you'd like just to comment? Well, on? I would like to say one thing just on transportation yes. before we leave. Uh, there's been no shortage of people out there who are, who are taking credit for getting that transportation plan. You know, it's always when, when something historical gets passed, then there are always those who want to take a little more credit than maybe they invested in it. Let me tell you, Chris Jones out of Suffolk deserves more credit than any legislator any legislator. I know there's some awards being passed out for it. Chris is the catalyst that made this happen and he deserves a 
tremendous amount of credit for his determination and his vision. Uh, there were other things that we, that we worked on. Um, obviously, um, one of the things that, that I worked on was, was the great texting bill that we've been trying to curb texting mm -hmm. uh, in, in Virginia. I promise you, as you're driving home today, if you look to the right and left, we'll somebody will be we'll texting and they may have a hot dog in the other hand, which is scary. It, it uh, is. And so we have made that a primary offense in Virginia starting July the 1st, meaning that a police officer doesn't have to stop you for something else. He may stop you if he, see, he or she sees that you're texting. And, and I apologize for our having to stop the program it's all right. at, at that point. We'll look forward to having you back on later this year to talk about the upcoming 2014 session. Thank you, David. some other issues. So thank you very much, Senator Tommy Norman. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosts an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. Working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.